Hi guys, George Galinsky here from Toe the Line, joined today by Dan Chapman. Dan, how you doing, my man? What's up, you champ? Are you, George? All right, buddy? Very well. Still nursing my broken nose and black eye from our sparring session, but doing very well. I trust you're you're enjoying lockdown. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying lockdown. I mean, you know, I mean, it's turning the negative into a positive all the time, and you know, I am fortunate. I am my own gym, so uh, I'm just making the most again my two sessions in a day. You know, which is which is great for the mind and especially during these uh, crazy times where there's not a lot to do. Yeah, I've seen the training videos. You're looking like a real hard worker, as you have been throughout your whole career. Let's talk about your career because it's something that hasn't been mentioned too much about your early beginnings. You're a very successful amateur boxer. So how did you get into boxing? Um, well, I was, I was in, for, in and out of foster care from, from a very young age, you know. And mm. um, I moved to a little village called Blind Grinby. Um, and for me, that's when life started. You know, I found a really good home. Um, I had amazing foster parents. They loved me like their own son. And there was a local boxing gym just opened. Um, and there hadn't, there hadn't been a boxing gym open for about 50 years in the village where I was from. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, it's a guy called John Radmore. And he sat, you know, we had, like, when, it, when a club opens, there was 50, 60 kids every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 o'clock. Uh, and I thought I'd join because I was football mad as a young kid. And yeah. You know, I love football, uh, and I had so much energy, and I thought, you know what, let's, let's try boxing. Um, and to be fair, you know, my coach, John Radmire, he took me all the way, you know. Um, with John, I ended up winning 10 Welsh titles, three British titles, and the Commonwealth Games. You know, yeah. so it was, and, and eventually was a Team GB athlete full-time, uh, up in the two, leading up to the 2012 Olympics. Mm. So, you know, for such a little small village that I was from, you know, We've done some great things, you know, since that guy, John Radmore, opened up that boxing gym. Yeah, and obviously you spoke there a bit about some early adversity coming through the foster care system. There's a lot of emphasis on people that have had disadvantaged upbringings and how boxing can really help them. How significant was it for you? Um, massively. I did, to be honest with you, um, I didn't have a, a lot of positive things in my life as a young kid. I went through, you know, really bad stuff. Um but I was very fortunate, you know, I was growing up and in and out of foster care and hostel homes. I know I'm going back and forth living with my mother. Um, I just I just believe that you can you can look back and you can you can play the victim or you can, you know, be really positive and just push forward and you know and be a better person or be a better person than the people who were around you when things were tough. Um, mm. so for me Going into boxing was a, was a great escape. You know, it, it, it learned me so many, it taught me so many things, you know, discipline, respect, being professional. Um, mm. And I was lucky enough that I was quite good at, at the sport of boxing from a young age. Yeah. And I got to travel the whole world, you know, mm. with Team Wales and Team GB. Um, I feel like from having such a rough start in life, um, I never allowed that to affect what was going to happen in my future, George. Mm. So, you know, that was the biggest thing for me to move on with my life was mm. to, you know, have good people around me. My association, my association had to be good. And, and, and the things that I would do in had to be positive. Mm. And you, you know, you achieved so much, as you said earlier, in the amateurs. Everything looked fantastic. You were, you were touted to be a future Olympian. And then it all came crashing down, a motorbike accident, horrific injuries. Explain to us exactly what happened there, because it was obviously catastrophic to your career. Yeah, um, I was part of Team GB on, from 2008 even up to 2012. Um, I started off on a development team. We used to go up there every two weeks. And then I went away with Ireland um, on an island trip. Um, and, I, and I made the podium team. You know, that was a full-time job Monday, Monday to Friday, um, training four times a day, like, you know, in... I was only 17 at the time. I just won the Commonwealth Games, you know, and I beat a number one English lad called James Dickens. Mm. He's a fantastic fighter, you know, and I beat him in the final by one point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was, that was the break of good things opening up for me. But I was 17. Um, mm. I'd already been at 51 kilos for three or four years at that time. Um, mm. So signing a contract with Team GB, going to the Olympics for 
51 kilos was was fantastic it was a dream come true but my body started to change you know from from training four to three to four times a day you know i started putting solid muscle on um and i started to struggle with making the weight you know um but I was so inexperienced to be such at a high level of boxing. I think when I joined Team GB Boxing, I think I only had 17 fights. Uh, the likes of Luke Campbell, Andrew Selby, Tom Stalker, um, you know, Callum Smith, all those fighters were on, you know, over 50, 60 international fights. Where mm -hmm. I was just turning up there, <laughs> I had about, you know, 10 international fights with Team Will. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and the only main tournament I had entered was the Commonwealth Games, and I won them. So, you know, it was always hard competing on that level with so little experience. But mm. the old saying is, you know, if you're good enough, you're good enough, you know? Mm. 100%. And obviously that injury kept you out for, what was it, seven years, the recovery process? Well, leading up to the Olympic Games was, we all had Olympic qualifiers to go to. Um, yeah. And I just won my Welsh senior title, and I beat Jay Harris in the final uh, I think I beat him like 15 nil. <laughs> it was like, you know, crazy. Just it was easy work. Uh, he's a good fighter, like you know. He's gone on as a professional and, and done amazing things, you know. And but we we all have the letter from Team Wales saying that if you won the Welsh Senior Championships, you'll have the Olympic box off. Yep. You'll have you'll, you'll have the chance to go to the Olympic qualifier. So, which is great. Um, but then in the end, then Wales put an obstacle in my way and. They made me then have a box off with Sean McGoldrick. And at oh. the time, he was just won the gold in the Commonwealth Games out in India. Yep. So, um, and then I, I boxed Sean and then I turned him over. You know, I beat him quite comfortable. Mm. Uh, and then he would have been going to the World Championships in Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. So I trained really hard. I moved up a weight. I went from 51 to 56 kilos. And at that time, I realized how important weight training was uh, mm. and weight management. And moving up a weight was just the greatest thing could ever happen to me, you know, because I went faster, I went stronger. I struggled the 51 kilos of flyweight for so many years when my body was screaming for me to move up a weight. Mm -hmm. And when I did move up a weight, I, 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 I totally understood then that it wasn't just about my ability. It was what, it's, it's all about your nutrition. It's all about what food you put in you. And by doing that, I started knocking boys out, you know, in sparring mm -hmm. and training. And it was a great confidence because leading up to the Olympic Games, I probably felt at that time moving to 56 kilos that nobody could beat me in the world at that time. Um, and it would have been out of me and Luke Campbell, um, whoever, whoever would have gone the furthest in the World Championships. Um, and then sadly, the week before the, the Worlds, uh, I had a really nasty motorbike accident. And I broke my femur, I broke my wrist. You know, I, I had so many injuries that... Um, it, 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 it totally stopped my career. The, doc, mm -hmm. no, the doctor said I'd never box again. He told me to play darts. <laughs> <laughs> Still got to use the wrist for that. Huh? <laughs> so, like after that then, it was really frustrating to be in so close to qualifying for the Olympic Games yeah. to then have my whole life just ripped away from me because I was so dedicated. I weren't one of those ones who just had talent. Yeah. I love working hard as well, George. You know, it was... When you put those two ingredients together, it's, you know, it's magic, you know. I mean, this is the world of sport boxing right now is, you know, you barely find the two together. It's either one who's very disciplined and who works hard or you've got the one who's so talented who, and, you know, who skives and they train in. And mm -hmm. at world level, if you want to be the best and stay the best, you need to have all the five ingredients. You can't, you, you get caught out. Um, so, yeah, after that accident, it was seven years of rehab, George. You know, I mean, it was awful. You know, it, was, it left me just mentally distraught, you know, and I just didn't think I'd box again. And, but to be fair, I'm always realistic. I was never a dreamer. Yeah. And I, and I generally believed that my career would, 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 was over, you know, and I, I, what the doctor told me, I, I, I took it on board. And I'm just happy to, to be alive, to be honest with you, after that accident. So, you know... Seven years later, you know, um, I, I eventually found the bug again. <laughs> um, I realised that I could box uh, again. You know, I started doing my bag work. And that's all I started doing was my bag work. You know, I didn't have any sparring, didn't have any pad work. I was just, you know, doing rounds and rounds in my local gym on the bag. And I thought, God, I feel I started to feel really good. 
Um, and then unfortunately, again, we had another serious injury. I'd have another full reconstruction then. Oh. So, but in the meantime, um, I'd done a, a sneaky PKB. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell my partner at the time. Uh, I, I didn't tell anybody, you know. Um, uh, one of the guys said a, a BKB fight and spoke to Jim and said, I got a guy for you from Wales who's really talented. Um, can he fight on your show? And I did. I didn't tell Saul. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up there and I remember uh, going into the show and the first fight, I think, is the American. Is it something, Josh? The big. Josh big Burns. Fight. Josh yeah. Burns. And he was the first fight and I was watching the fight and I was just like, shit, what am I even doing here? <laughs> this is. This is fucking nuts. <laughs> I could see blood splattering from the ring. <laughs> I thought, right, I'm going to the change rooms. I'm putting my earphones on and I'm focusing. <laughs> yeah. And I think Jim Martin uh, matched me up with a guy called Martin Thorne. And yeah. he's a lovely guy. You know, he, he, we both weighed the same weight. to 65 kilos, which was great. Yeah. And, and I, just, I just knocked him out in a round. I think it, it was on a jab. You know, and after that fight, I just had the love for BKB. It was brilliant. I loved it from since from there on. I said it must have been quite a culture shock because obviously the amateur boxing scene is pretty structured. You know, it's in in many ways a civilized sport in comparison. How how was that then coming into that new environment and experiencing you know the new senses around you in bare knuckle boxing? To be honest with you, George, I mean, when you've done the repetition and the hours of boxing that I have, yeah, it's quite simple. You know, I mean. Yeah. When I go into the ring, I don't see that oh, the guy is bigger than me, the guy is smaller than me, the guy is faster than me. I go on my qualities, and that's my speed, that's my power, my angles, my footwork, my movement. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always bring that package, you know, and that's where the difference between being good and great is that confidence in your ability, mm -hmm. you know. And for me, as I've had the years of being nervous and, you know, fighting the top Olympic fighters like the Cubans, the Russians, the Kazakhs, the Ukraines. I used to be like watching them shadowing the leaves off the trees when I'd be out in the <laughs> before a tournament. I'd be like, shit, I hope he's not I'd be like, I hope he's not my weight. <laughs> you know? um, those days, you know, that, that's the journey of experience. And I'm yeah. so experienced now that I feel like I don't get nervous. You know, I have when I when I when I do the you know the setup before a fight, the training camps you know, leading up to the changing rooms, the, the walking in before the fight. I just feel like I've done it so many times, you know, I think it just becomes so natural now. Mm -hmm. There was quite a considerable time gap between the Martin Thorne fight and then the James Kennelly fight. Yeah. Was there a particular reason for that gap or was it just finding finding your way back into the sport? Well, it's just seeing really how my partner reacted to finding yeah. out, out about my first BKB, which I didn't tell anyone, you know, and she didn't want me fighting, which is understandable. But you know, for me, is I'm I fell back in love with the sport. I'm 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 obsessed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I love the sport, and it's crazy because as people go on into their boxing career, they sort of lose the love of it. Mm -hmm. But I just I just found a new love for the for the sport of boxing, and um, I love teaching. I love passing that knowledge on. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, when you're obsessed with something, and you still love it. You know, it doesn't seem like a chore anymore. It doesn't, it, you know, it's just, it's just what I do best. I just love doing it, you know. And so the gap between, you know, from the, the first fight was just because my knee, I had to have a knee operation. Um, and then coming back, um, PKB were doing a tournament, weren't they? You know, the 10K prize. And, and I'm a natural 60 kilo fighter. So <laughs> They were saying uh, the weight was from 76 to 81. I was like, I said, my weight, I can beat these guys. <laughs> I'm entering. So I dropped Jim a message and he goes, Jim, I said, you know, can I enter the tournament? And he goes, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, and I was one of the names to be pulled in. Um, you know, I was a little bit nervous of the weight and the height, to be honest with you. Mm. But again, it's just having that full confidence in your ability and what you can do. So, you know, I couldn't see anybody in a tournament who would have troubled me, um, mm -hmm. especially with the bigger guys. Their footwork is so slow. So for me, as I knew I would have got close in the end and I would have chinned them. So, you know, Canary was me, was maybe the one I was thinking, if anyone was going to test me, it would have been James. Mm -hmm. um, I seen, you know, 
you know, little chinks in in Franco's armor that I thought I I, I believed I could beat. But it was up to those two boys, you know, um, who was going to give me the 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 the, the push. Uh, mm-hmm. And when I jumped in with James, you know, it was a great fight. You know, um, I had a huge injury going into the fight, but you know, I didn't complain about it. I didn't have any excuses. I just mm-hmm. I wanted to get in, get the job done. I then set myself up then for the fight with Franco because I knew on paper that would have been me and him in the final. Mm. As I say, you won the fight, dropping James Kennedy twice, but it didn't quite go to plan. It was a shoulder injury that yeah. stopped you from getting into the semi final. How frustrating was that? Again, injury plaguing your career. I was absolutely get there because I think when you're a five knee tune athlete like me, like I don't have camps. I don't have eight week camps or you know, I'm always in the gym. So you know, my body's always fit, it's always ready. So having him, having that injury was so frustrating because, you know, I don't miss a day of training, you know. The, the point was I wanted to win the prize, you know, and, and there was the, that was the 10K prize that I was wanting to win to help me set up my new boxing gym. So, you know, it weren't that money wasn't for me. It was to build, you know, my future of teaching boxing. So, but when the injury happened, I just, I was gutted because, you know, for me, it would have been a great foundation uh, uh, to, to to display my talent to the BKB fans, you know. I've seen, obviously, with your time out leading up to your next fight, which we'll talk about in a second, you've really fallen in love with coaching, it seems. You're giving back to the community. I've seen a lot of stuff with you know, disabled uh, people. It's, uh, it's very inspiring to see. What, what has inspired you to get so involved with your community? Um, to be honest with you, because I, I had a such a poor background. I had nothing as a young kid. So, uh, and the boxing gym when I was, when I first started off, George, it was just a little boxing gym, you know, it had nothing, you know. There was an old guy, John Radmore, he had a heart of gold, uh, and again, was obsessed with bo- teaching boxing, you know. And um, for me, is I just wanted to make sure that if I can do it with my circumstances, 100% know that I can create champions in a small community and have them to travel the whole world. Like at the age of 17, I traveled to every country on the planet, basically. You know, I mean, you know, with, with all my international fights were, as an amateur, I didn't have like a novice. After my third fight, I won a Welsh title. <laughs> and then from there onwards, I was fighting international, you know, <laughs> which was mental, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, with Team Wales, they sent me all over the world, you know. and. That was the biggest joy for me. It weren't being part of Team Wales. It weren't being, you know, an elite fighter. I love travelling, George. Mm. And when you go to these countries, like we went to third world countries, rich countries, but the people you meet on the way is just, you, you, you money can't buy it, you know. You need to go and do it to see it and, um, and put yourself in that, in that culture of people who have nothing, but yet they're the happiest people in the world. Um, and when you start mixing with those kind of people, it's just life experience like like i said you can't buy it so for me is that's my goal is to teach in my community boxing mm. so they are you know i've got some sort of positive in their life because today children are so social media crazy that they don't lift their head off the phone so mm. for me george it's like we have got to move on with the times we can't say to the children, get off your phones. Well, that is, this is 2021, you know, this, this is the way life is going. So for me is this abuse uh, social media positively and use it with the boxing and display what people are doing in my gym. So mm. I started putting the videos up of the kids boxing and people like to see, you know, I'm a mm. visual person. So when the people started seeing what I was doing with the kids, you know, it's just, the gym just kicked off really well, and uh, and again, you know, it's it's getting the kids to get that fitness in, keeping them nice and healthy, and nothing is stopping any of those children doing what I'm what, what I did, or if not better, you know, and I can coach them and show them with my experience as well, you know, to do the good things, not the bad things, like weight control as it goes on, you know, being disciplined, you know, not going down the route of drugs and alcohol, all these things that these young kids face every day, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a great coach and a great fighter as well. So let's talk about that fighting side. Sean George, the opponent next, it seems. Have we got an idea of a date at the moment? Because obviously with COVID, it's sort of thrown everything into disarray. Yeah, I think Jim posted today. Um, it's going to be the end of March, which is yeah. fantastic. You know, I mean, I've been wanting this fight. I, I've done three camps. <laughs> 
you know, so I think Sean done a podcast, Sean George, I think last week or over Christmas, uh, and he was saying like, you know, that I am wanted to fight, and I just think that's I don't know where he's got that from because. I've been ready after every camp, and the only reason why we haven't fought is because of lockdown. And yeah. on the first lockdown show, I messaged Jim straight away, and I wanted to fight Sean on that show. Yeah. Uh, and he said, "Oh, it's going to be a bit because I could see on social media that people like Sean was writing statuses, or I think Smudger was writing statuses, thinking they were going to fight." I was thinking, "Wait, hold on a minute." I'm thinking, "That's my fight, like you know." Yeah. So, but Jim, you know, he said, he, he did apologise. He said, you know, Dan Sawyer should have phoned you first. He said, Sean is going to fight uh, Smudger Smith. And I thought, oh, okay, but, you know, I, I am ready. Like, you know, I'm ready to fight. So yeah. I was a bit gutted because I had spent so much time in the gym on the two camps. Obviously, you put that extra, you know, oomph into your camp then. Um, and then to find out then that it was cancelled and then somebody else fighting and it was a little bit disheartening. I was just like, oh, is this fight really going to happen? So yeah. I just want, I just wanted a bit of truth and honesty, just like, you know, I'm ready to fight. So, you know, give me a date and I, and I just go, Danny fighting on that date. I'm an easy fighter to work with. Just text me a date and I just go, yes, you know. Um, so, yeah, leading up to this fight at the March, I'm, I just can't wait to get in there and, and do the business like Exciting. I was going to ask if, you know, lockdown two was a possibility. Seems yeah. to be pretty positive then. Obviously, this fight is the first Wales versus Wales bare knuckle fight. We've been waiting for it for so long. Does that add a bit of an edge to it? A bit of pride in there? Is there anything there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Sean has achieved so much in BKB, you know. I mean, he's been, he's going to be in the, the Hall of Fame with the BKB Um I mean, you know, he's had so much experience in it, you know, and I think over the years he's he's been very lucky to get that experience because even his he tell himself, you know, his boxing standard isn't great. So, you know, he's had like Vince Cleverly in his corner, you know, managing him to get that boxing quality better. And, and it has it's it's paid off fantastically. He's, he's over the years he's got better and better. But if you notice since that tournament with me, Franco James Canelli, the likes of Smudger coming into BKB then, the levels have changed. Mm. You know, and you, if we're not talking about, you know, um, the likes of Christian Evans and who were, you know, the the name, the, the big names of BKB a couple of years ago fighting, you know, in in in, in the bands and stuff, you know. Um, now, after that prize fighter tournament, people were just like, whoa, look at this is crazy. You know, these guys are they, they 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 talented fighters, you know, they all got you know, they all done well in the individual sport at a high level, you know. Um and I think people then, the ones who were in the part of BK before have just pushed away. Mm. I don't blame them, you know, because it's not you know, coming in with a big belly or, you know, just having a phone call up gym and no training and just stepping in. Now, you know, we've got full time athletes fighting bare knuckle. Um and I think Sean has started to see, you know, as he's got into the, the fights at the end of his career, that the level has gone up and he's found it a lot harder now. You know, yeah. and then losing to James Canelli, um, you know, and, and James boxed fantastic that night against James. He did, you know, uh, against Sean, sorry. Um, and then, you know, George, Sean George fighting Smudger Smith. You know, personally, I believe Smith won the fight. Yep. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I'm not just saying it. Like, I wanted Sean to win it because yeah. it wouldn't have been good if Sean lost, and then I'm fighting Sean for the world title. Does that make sense? Yeah. I wanted Sean to, to really display himself against that fight, but for me, smother box absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, the first two rounds were very close, but as the rounds went on. Smudger was very comfortable and looked a stronger fighter, so I had to give it to. To, to, to Smith because he won the last two rounds as well, you know. So, yeah. you know, I was a little bit gutted for him because I understand that that would have been a really good, you know, break for him in, 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 in BKB. For sure, yeah. I mean, it was it was a difficult one. It's, it is a fight which is, I would argue, it's probably the closest fight in BKB history because there's so many variants to it. Obviously, there's a bit of criticism towards the refereeing in that if the knockdowns have been placed, then maybe it's a different result. It's 
It's a hard yeah, one yeah. to judge, but I was I have to say I was very surprised to hear you thought Smudger Smith won, but no, I I I feel I'm never biased in any way. Yeah. Um I've got a good relationship with Smudger. I know yeah. Sean quite well. Um and I I, I I would never avoid someone's victory over yeah. being biased. Um Smudger for me hundred percent won the fight. So, you know, that was really good because I've done hundreds of rounds. Uh, I say hundreds, many rounds with Smudger, you know, yeah. and um, it was a great fight for me to sit back and watch, mm. to to see where really Sean's level is, you know, mm. and and for me, as it was, you know, it was that was an important fight for me to watch. Definitely, definitely. Well, it's a, as I said, it's going to be a fight that's going to be hotly anticipated by fans. So finally, it's always a difficult question, but who have you got to thank for this journey? Are there any particular individual sponsors, so on? Yeah, I've got so many good sponsors, local pubs, you know, local cake parlors. Um, you know, I, I, I mainly, one of the guys who's, re, I've got an amazing relationship with him is Adrian Sharon. It's his, um, he's got a scaffolding business. Um, and he's just been like my best friend, my padman, my support. He organizes my sparring, he organizes all the tickets. Um, I just can't thank him enough, really, because without people like Adrian, I can't just focus on boxing. Mm. Um, so he does all the stuff that I don't like to do. <laughs> so, um, and, but, and, and me, he's a good mate, you know. So, mm. you know, I think leading up to this Sean George fight, um, he understands my background and where I've come from. Um, it, it's, it's, this fight is going to be, you know, a personal thing for us too, because winning a world title in BKB will, is... Is something that I've always wanted to do. I win any kind of world world title, really, especially it would have been in boxing. I, I had my my sets on, uh, eyesight's on, but in BKB, this is the chance where I can really show people my skills, my talent, and my hard work, um, and, and be a nice guy as well. You know, I mean, I don't I have no ego. You know, I, like you said, you know, I love teaching. I love you know expressing my feelings and 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 showing you know that. Discipline and hard work will, and will hundred percent get you where you want to go in life. And it doesn't have to be in boxing or a sport. It can be in work. It can be, you know, with your family. It can be, you know, any given thing that 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 you love really. And so, you know, I, I'm really excited about the Sean George fight because, you know, he's the perfect fighter for me to fight the king to the big name. You know, we got the best of the titles on the line. It's, it's a world title. We've all got something, you know really magic going to happen on that night and, um, and whoever wins the fight is going to be you know a magnific magnificent moment for either fighter um, but I'm going to bring that belt back home and I'm going to show Sean George the levels between you know fighting over his last few years where you're fighting you know mediocre fighters to some elite level like me mm. Inspirational man, inspirational story Dan, thank you for your time Top man <laughs>